I would like to start out with uh, an opening presentation. Um, in the past, we've gone right into case studies. Uh, this year, we wanted to take a step back and say, okay, we've come a long way when, it ta when, it, when we're talking about virtualization, um, what pieces of your ecosystem make sense in the cloud. Um, so what about the stuff that doesn't necessarily make sense in the cloud, and where is that line drawn? Um, so Dave Klee from A&E Networks, who's been a, a longtime supporter of SVG and a member of our Sports Content Management Committee, um, has agreed to uh, join us and tell us a little about where it makes sense. So Dave, please, please come up. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming out early on a Monday morning for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, and thanks to Jason and SVG. Really excited to get to talk a little bit about some um, topics that I'm very passionate about and have been working a lot on the last decade or so, really focused on media supply chains and how media supply chains are changing with new technologies and with the cloud. Um, so that's really what we're going to go through today is sort of what a typical media supply chain will look like across a broad set of use cases how that's really starting to change with today's world and uh, the advent of the cloud and a lot of new technologies there, uh, and about crossing the line, about moving from systems inside of our own walls to systems outside of our own walls, from things in our data centers and organizations to things that might be outside hosted in a public or private cloud. Uh, a little bit about me before we get going. Um, I went to school in Phoenix and started gripping for trucks. I started off in sports. so. Um, Sunday Night Baseball and uh, ESPN, Fox Sports, ABC Sports would come to town. They needed guys to haul cables around, so I started doing that. Uh, eventually, a cable or eventually a camera guy didn't show up, and they just handed me a camera, and they're like, "Hey, you're a camera guy now. Congratulations!" Uh, so I started getting into the more creative side of the business. I started um, shooting camera, doing editing, working in corporate agencies, uh, and working in productions for sporting venues, including uh, Arizona Cardinals. Uh, but I got annoyed doing the creative work, uh, how much of your time is spent on non-value-added activities, how much of your time as an editor is spent like getting files and transcoding, putting things where they need to be, and trying to find your old project and trying to get the right settings in your timeline. I felt like that was all kind of annoying from a creative person's perspective that you spent so much time doing stuff that wasn't adding creative value to your project and your output. Um, so I went back to school and started getting to the technology side of the business, kind of convinced that we could do it better, that there were better options from the technology standpoint to make creative lives easier. Um, so then I had some opportunities to work at some uh, organizations uh, like NBC News and Univision. NBC News, we really went through and uh, did a redesign, a long-term archive, the MAM system for NBC News. Uh, and at Univision, we had a great opportunity to really rebuild the internal supply chain of, uh, of the company for processing media. Uh, and then recently I've been able to join A&E Networks, a great organization. Uh, we've got History Channel, Lifetime, FYI, Viceland, a few other things. Um, and, uh, and has been really forward thinking, looking at how to utilize these new, new technologies and look at the cloud. Uh, and I am hiring. If any of this sounds interesting, please come uh, talk to me a little bit later on. Um, so really I've been focused on the TV side of the business. Uh, and uh, we're going to go through sort of the supply chain from a television perspective. Um, keep in mind a few disclaimers. Opinions are my own. They don't represent any place that I have ever or will ever work at. Just uh, talking from my perspective here. Um, I'm going to talk about some vendors that I've been aware of or used or had some interaction with in the past. I think when you're learning about new technologies, it really helps to see some examples of vendors in that space to kind of get you pointed in the right direction. But do your own research. Mentions are not endorsements. I'm not saying anything is the right thing for you, but just trying to get some orientation to a particular space. Uh, final disclaimer is yes, I'm aware it is a sports conference. Um, A&E has a fairly light sports footprint. We do have some sports properties. Um, but uh, I'm going to be talking a lot today about very generic workflows, very generic supply chains, things that really apply to the media business and to getting content to consumers. Uh, and so those use cases and those technologies, I think, apply very well to the sports space, but also to news and entertainment. And I'm trying to stay relatively generic and not necessarily focus on those specific sports use cases. But I will a couple times and call those out um, to be specific. But in general, the way that we're delivering content to consumers, no matter what industry you're in, is changing very, very quickly. Uh, in order to keep up with that change, we really need to look at how we're getting content to consumers and how we're processing content and all the steps before 
delivering it to a consumer. So I think when you're looking at the world changing quickly in the delivery space, you need to focus a little bit upstream on the supply chains that we are all building and maintaining and working through ourselves to get that content to consumers. And that's really what I've been focusing on the last decade or so is thinking of media as a supply chain. So supply chain thinking really comes out of manufacturing. Um, it's you know an, an old idea about building durable goods like cars and refrigerators that you take raw materials in one end, you apply a process to them, you put those materials together, and at the end you have a finished good that you're ready to sell or do something with or distribute. Um, and there are a lot of different ways of thinking about manufacturing supply chains that have started to make their way into the business world, into things that are not necessarily making hard goods in terms of a supply chain. Uh, Lean and Six Sigma are two very popular ones, kind of focus on uh, taking those series of steps and making sure that you don't make a mistake, don't create a defect, or making sure that you don't have waste in the process where you're handing things off from one stage to another. But no matter the process, no matter the, uh, the formal methodology, uh, in my mind they all kind of boil down to you have raw inputs, you apply a process to them which adds value, and then out of that process you create an output that's ready to go. And I think that fits very well in the media space and you start thinking about media supply chains because we're all doing roughly the same thing. We're taking raw material in at one end of a supply chain, whether that, that could be a finished program that's ready to go on television and internally you need to apply some processes to it to get it ready to distribute and ready to go to all the different endpoints it needs to go. Could be raw materials, you're putting together a package and then that package is gonna be distributed on a, a live television program. No matter what the process in the media space, and fairly generically, the, these process improvement initiatives all kind of boil down to look at your inputs, look at the process you're applying to them, and look at the outputs that are coming out of that. So if we take that and apply this more directly to the media supply chain space, and particularly looking at uh, historical media supply chains all the way back in, in 2007, we'll talk a little bit about uh, 2007 and why that's an important turning point in a couple minutes. But if you look at historically, media supply chains have built inputs based on uh, videotapes that are often arriving or linear video feeds. Maybe they're coming off of a satellite or some other linear transmission method. You're processing them internally. You're editing together videos. You're logging them. You're adding notes, reviewing and approving. And then your outputs of this process have typically been a linear playback device. You're actually getting television to go on television. You're queuing up files or tapes to be played back on television cable distribution. And then in theory, uh, you're saving a copy to your archive. That's the hope is that you're also keeping a copy of this master for reuse later. So pretty linear process, all things considered. And the beautiful thing about this in the pre-2007 world is that most of this has been happening historically inside of a media organization's walls, inside of our own buildings and data centers and systems that we can look at and touch and configure and adjust and do whatever we need to. It's a pretty straightforward world and in the supply chain thinking, all of that inside of our walls allows for some control over the handoff, some control over moving from one step to another because it's stuff we all can look at and build and maintain and change the way that we see fit for each of our organizations. But that idea of keeping everything inside of our own walls uh, is changing very quickly today, and it, it started changing, really, I would argue, around that time. Um, there's an interesting book that was written a couple of years ago, Thomas Friedman's Thank You for Being Late. Um, interesting book, and the first part of it, he really talks about how the pace of technological change is growing exponentially, um, and that we as humans are only able to keep up with it so well uh, and he actually sat down with uh, Astro Teller, who's the head of uh, Google's Moonshot program at one point in the book, and uh, came up with this graph that essentially puts this down on paper in some way that makes sense, where the technology growth curve you can see is starting off pretty low and has started to go up. Our human adaptability has been pretty flat the entire time. We as humans are able to adjust to new technologies and new things pretty fast, and that's increasing over time. But the Astro Teller and then Thomas Friedman argues in the book that we've now hit the point where this technology growth curve has started to go up exponentially and has started to surpass what we can all do as humans to keep up with the level of change. 
Um, and so this leads to, leads to some very unintended consequences and some very surprising consequences. This is from uh, Singularity Hub, which is a, a website with Ray Kurzweil's writing on it. But it all kind of comes back to Moore's Law, which is one of the original ideas around exponential growth in technology. Moore's Law originally applied just to the doubling of processor power every two years. But uh, in today's world, uh, Friedman and others in the book argue that Moore's Law, the doubling of technology change, the doubling of power, this exponential growth, really applies to a lot of things in technology, and in particular, the cloud is enabling a lot of these new exponential growths in technology, exponential changes. And as humans, this is difficult for us to keep up with because growth, exponential growth uh, on that previous graph, it starts very flat, it looks very normal. It doesn't really kick in until later, and when it kicks in, it leads to some very surprising consequences. Um, one way to summarize this, which also is mentioned in the book, is uh, the idea of the chessboard. There's an old parable about the chessboard, and the inventor of chess supposedly so impressed the king that it was in his kingdom, the king said, I will give you anything you want. You have invented chess. This is a phenomenal thing. Just name what you want. And so the guy said, okay, I'd like enough rice to feed my family. And, and the king said, great, absolutely, you can have that, no problem. How much rice would you want? And uh, supposedly the guy who invented chess thought about it and said, you know what, I tell you what, take my chessboard that you like so much, just put one grain of rice on that first square of the chessboard and then double it and put two grains of rice on the second square of the chessboard and double it again to four grains of rice, double it again to eight grains of rice. And the king stopped him right there and said, absolutely, you will have that much rice. That is fantastic. Not realizing, of course, that in, when you really put the numbers on that, that's like an astronomical number by the time that you've doubled to 64 times. It's it, in terms of bytes, if you started with one byte and then two bytes and then uh, four bytes and you double all the way 64 times, you end up with something like nine exabytes. It's like 90 quadrillion. It's like impossible to wrap your head around how big a number this is. It's if you took that number of grains of rice and laid them end to end to end, you'd have uh, something like a 58 trillion mile long string of rice, which is enough to get to the moon and back 125 million times. It's an insane number that makes no sense. But it starts very predictably. It starts very linearly. The first half of the chessboard sort of looks like growth as you would expect growth to be. But he sort of coined the term back then, Ray Kurzweiler did, uh, hitting the second half of the chessboard. Hitting the second half of the chessboard after you've doubled and doubled and doubled and continued to see that exponential growth, you start to see those really unpredictable effects come out, those things that you really didn't expect. At first it looks pretty normal, but after a while it really starts to make some unexpected things happen. Um, and so again in the book he argues that 2007 was really the year we started to hit in our technology space the second half of the chessboard. Um, so we've been growing from the microprocessor era all through a lot of different technologies, but 2006 to 2008, right around that 2007 mark, really is a remarkable time in technology. That's when uh, Twitter was announced, Facebook started to uh, expand beyond college campuses at that time, internet hit a billion internet users at that time, YouTube came online in 2006, um, Netflix started working, Hulu launched their first streaming service in 2008, I believe. Uh, and in 2007, the big thing that really changed was what people thought of as television. Uh, this iPhone, the introduction of the iPhone, is really what changed what people did for consuming what we thought of as television, for consuming media and video in particular. And of course, AWS and uh, the ideas of cloud computing came out of a few different companies right around this time. And so this change in what people thought of as television and the launch of these services that were suddenly streaming video for a lot of media companies was the first time that we were all starting to think about crossing the line, that suddenly we had all of these things we used to control inside of our own walls, often including getting the content to the consumer, which was taken care of on a device, a lot of devices, inside of our network, inside of our own walls that we would then stream over a satellite or to wherever it needed to be. Now for the first time, we all started to look at crossing the line outside of our walls and giving our content over to somebody else in the internet or in another service for delivery to consumers. And so that really was an interesting change for our media supply chain because we had been so focused on inside our own walls and inside uh, our own data centers and facilities. 
and then we added on this new output. And for a lot of places, it started pretty simple. It started, you know, with the basic stages of this exponential growth, right? We started adding digital distribution. Maybe we de made a deal with Hulu or Netflix or one particular distribution partner. And that was now one more thing that was expected to come out of these internal processes that we had built. And so that was pretty good to start. And you think about what's involved in digital distribution. Uh, usually you're not using the exact same video file that you would use to play back on television. You're using something else to get to a digital distribution partner. And so you're going to transcode that file. You're going to package it up with the right metadata. You're going to probably do some quality checks. And then when you've got everything ready to go, you're going to send it off to your final destination, upload it to Hulu, upload it to whatever streaming partner you have. And so that worked pretty well when we all had our first streaming deal and our first partner to onboard. We basically took our internal stuff, and when we were done, we packaged it up and we said, okay, now we're going to cross the line. Now we're going to take the time, we're going to take the, the wait time to send this stuff outside of our organization and upload it to the final destination. Great for one partner, but then once you realize you have five partners or ten partners or a few dozen partners or a few hundred partners, this starts to become really inefficient. And so the, the kind of more modern way to look at it that's been coming around the last few years is that you get your content, you get your master video files up into your cloud, up into a tool that's going to help process them earlier. So you send one master out into a cloud and then you process it and distribute it many different times from there. So you pay the penalty to and then wait time and waste sending that content up once and then from there you can redistribute many different times which to, to a lot of people it's not the right situation or not right strategy for every situation but for a lot of folks this really helps solve the bottleneck of crossing that final line and getting content to distributors many different times. Let's just pay the penalty once and distribute many from there. Um, so that's great. So that has sort of put digital for a lot of folks as the first thing firmly over the line, firmly outside of our walls, depending on the strategy and technologies you have. You're producing things that are now outside of your walls in systems that you may not be able to look at and touch and configure and change as you used to. Uh, and the same thing is now starting to happen in other places in the supply chain, particularly ingest. So 2007, think back to a very videotape-based world. We were sending videotapes around. If we were sending files, we might send a hard drive full of files. Um, but often we would send linear video feeds as well and just transmit things over satellite because that was easier. But uh, coming along shortly after 2007 and then in 2009, 2010 with videotape being harder and harder to get a hold of is the idea of file-based ingest. So we as media organizations are receiving content from all over the world, from all different people. And we're receiving that content and then transferring it often at, into our systems locally. And then we're checking it out, making sure it's what we want, and editing it together and using it throughout the rest of the supply chain. And, and that, again, worked pretty well. But the same concept here applies of if you're going to take your content and wait to transfer it in, waste the, the time, and also spend the money in terms of egress and transfer, wouldn't it be great to make sure it's really the content you want to use? And, a lot of times, especially in the early days of file-based ingest, the content wasn't always exactly what we needed. It wasn't always exactly what we wanted, but we had already spent the time bringing it down into our systems. So there are a lot of tools that have been coming around the last few years, particularly on the file-based ingest side of the equation, to store that for you in the cloud, have things in a uh, type of portal. You can review it, quality check it, do some basic work in the cloud and only bring it down, only spend that penalty, pay that penalty to bring it into your systems when you're sure it's what you want. And so there again, that's sort of an extension of what we started to do on the digital distribution side, bringing that to the beginning of the supply chain in the file-based ingest world. So now we've got this world where we've expanded digital distribution and file-based ingest, both pretty firmly above the line in some cases, but we've created a problem for ourselves where a lot of the content we receive and then a lot of the content we distribute is crossing the line outside of our organizations and we're paying a penalty to bring it down into our systems and then we're paying another penalty to upload it and send it out of our systems at the end of the day. Um, so a lot of people start to ask, of course, could we just do this? Could we just take the files that we're receiving in the cloud from other people, kind of keep them there, do what we need to do, and then get them out to digital distribution endpoints? 
So there have been a lot of tools evolving in that space too, kind of in the middle of the supply chain, in the processing stage. Uh, when it comes to review and approval tools, tools that do quality control have been moving to the cloud and doing file-based quality control and checking of assets. Uh, and there's been some really interesting things happening in the cloud editing space the last couple years. So historically, I would say the cloud editing space has moved along pretty slowly because you need the real-time access to video to be able to do changes to your video in the cloud. And that's often worked better. You need a full-blown real editing system with real storage attached and some more heavy-duty um, video processing equipment internally. But that's starting to change, and especially for very supply chain focused things. If you're doing light touch editing, if you're just chopping off the beginning and end of a master, or you're just changing the amount of blacks between segments in a television program, that's pretty simple stuff. And there are actually some tools evolving pretty quickly in the cloud that let you do that kind of work uh, and keep it in the cloud and then just take it from there. Um, there I think there'll be some things we'll talk about later today, but um, some of the craft editing, some of the more detailed editing in the cloud is starting to move there a little bit. Um, Media Composer from Avid is starting to launch cloud offerings. There's some other things happening in AWS. Um, so there's some things to talk about there, but really when it comes to content manipulation, this world is starting to come along, uh, and particularly if you're doing very high throughput and low touch work, this is starting to become very viable. So we've built now, let's say hypothetically we've got file-based ingest coming in, we've got some cloud processing tools, and now we've got uh, digital distribution all above the line. So what's left below the line, historically this is the real-time video processing things, the, the feeds and the playback. Um, those things are starting to change a little bit too. From a couple years ago at AWS uh, reInvent, which is uh, Amazon's annual conference, there were some really interesting case studies from Discovery and from Turner. Um, Discovery in particular where they're starting to do what historically we've needed, real hardware in our own facilities to play back a television channel in real time. That stuff has started to move to the cloud a little bit. They're starting to make it so that you can get into that space and have real-time linear playback and sometimes even real-time ingest fees. There are a few vendors, there are a lot of vendors, I think it's moving very quickly in this space when it comes to trying to do real-time video feeds. There are different uses for different use cases. It really depends on what you're looking to do. Um, but the real-time video world really used to be only inside your walls. It's starting to evolve, and I think, relatively quickly. So if we've got our supply chain and we're able to do real-time video in the cloud, what's left? There's tape and then there's archive. So uh, first on videotape, let's be done with videotape. Let's all agree we want to be done with videotape. There are different ways of getting done with videotape. Um, but the videotape of this world can't really fit into a new paradigm easily. It needs to be digitized, it needs to be available, it needs to be queued up and ready to go. If you need to go back to videotape every time you want to reuse something, that's a real challenge. And I'm, I'm not going to necessarily belabor that point on getting on a soapbox about how your videotapes are currently decaying on shelves and slowly going away before your very eyes. So we'll, we'll get off that soapbox and we'll move on. So in theory, we're getting rid of videotape in this world and we're not necessarily going to move forward with that, hypothetically, uh, in a perfect scenario. Uh, so what's left now, then we have the archive. And so historically, here again, the archives have been internal because that's the most cost-effective way to do it. That's the most effective way to connect it to the rest of our systems. When all of our systems were internal, of course, you wanted your archive system internal so that it could connect back to your editing systems and your real-time video processing systems. So if you needed to reuse something, you could get at it quickly. That's the only way that it really made sense. But now that we've moved a lot of things into the cloud, particularly, let's say, digital distribution, if you want to reuse something out of your archive, if you want to go back to something in the past, you're actually paying a big penalty because your archive is now back in your facility, inside your walls, behind, in many places, an LTO tape robot that only can do so much work at a particular time and only pump so much data through at a particular time. And if you want to reuse stuff in the cloud, that can become a real bottleneck for you. In addition to that, with the archive back behind uh, our walls inside our own organizations, we don't necessarily get to take advantage of a lot of the new technologies that are evolving in the cloud. So you look at cloud archiving, uh, which and kind of this idea of asynchronous annotation, which is taking uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and applying it to large volumes of media archives. 
And that's really where some interesting things are happening in the cloud space. So you can take your archive, you can uh, find new assets, derive intelligence, find associations in there that you might not have been able to do when it's locked away in your internal walls behind an LTO archive robot. Um, so making that data accessible to these new things and taking advantage of these new technologies as the cloud continues to drive that exponential transformation in technology kind of allows some interesting things to be done inside the archive. Um, uh, the bottom left corner, it used to be the cost of archiving it was really untenable for the big media files to move to the cloud. Uh, and that's the graph in the corner is showing the price of the lowest tier of Amazon storage since it was announced. It's a linear decrease as the big black line, but then the blue line is actually tracking the lowest cost Amazon storage tier since Amazon announced cloud storage. So it's not like at zero yet, but um, with the new announcement last week of essentially a dollar a terabyte for the Glacier Deep Archive, given that's cold storage that's only good for certain situations, but a dollar per terabyte is pretty compelling, and especially if you're dealing with a big LTO archive with LTO tapes, uh, you can't really afford to not think about that and just dismiss that a dollar per terabyte. And if that curve continues, I don't know if that ever actually hits zero, but the idea that we're actually seeing a decrease in costs while we're seeing exponential growth in features and functionality, it's a compelling use case. It's, it's worth thinking about. Um, some interesting applications I would look at uh, that I think are fascinating. Google Photos, it's sort of built to be your own simple little photo library, but there's machine learning and artificial intelligence behind the scenes there um, that's really accessible and really easy to use. I think it's a really interesting proof of concept for what can be done in archives. I uh, recommend for free if, if you're interested to check it out. And Microsoft's Video Indexer is also, I think, a really interesting proof of concept of what can be exposed, what kinds of things can be done when you're taking machine learning and artificial intelligence and turning it loose on your archive. So, okay, so we got the archive, we moved the archive into the cloud hypothetically, and so now we have this world where almost everything is outside of our walls. Uh, and is that really the case? You know, not today, not really, not for most people. Um, is that really going to be the case? Potentially, there could be some real use cases where particularly for smaller organizations and where you're just starting and your primary output is a digital distribution, um, there are some real compelling use cases here. So where is the line? Where is the line for you? Honestly, I have no idea. Um, it's going to be different for every organization. Um, it's going to be different for every use case. It's going to be different for every workflow. But I think the important thing to think about is where is the line for you? Where is the line for your organization? It's not it's not, in my mind, important that you have the right strategy, the perfect strategy, that there, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all strategy for leveraging these new technologies and moving into the cloud. I think it's just having a strategy is the important thing. I think everybody needs to look at what the strategy is for your organization that makes sense, what the right moves are that enable your workflows. Because those without a strategy, I think, will really get left behind. I think that exponential growth in technology is going to continue to grow and those who don't have a strategy to at least understand where that's going and understand what might be able to be leveraged in their organization are going to have a very difficult time catching up to that exponential growth curve once things keep moving along. So a couple uh, final disclaimers here. Um, there are, of course, risks. This is not all sunshine and rainbows. Uh, there are a lot of risks to be managed if you're looking at moving workflows to the cloud. Uh, legal risks, security risks, uh, and financial. There's a big change and how finances work when paying for the cloud. That can't be overlooked, it needs to be looked at um, as part of a strategy and, and for larger organizations, I know that can be a challenge. Uh, like I said, there is no one size fits all. I don't believe uh, different use cases, different workflows, different groups require different strategies. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that the future is very difficult to predict. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, science fiction, kind of near-term science fiction, and I think it's interesting to kind of look back on the predictions that they make and see how they came together or didn't come together. Um, uh, one of the things that stuck with me was um, uh, Fahrenheit 451, uh, written in the 50s. At one point, there's this long scene in the book uh, in a bank where the banks have evolved so much that they have robotic tellers that will come and help you with your banking needs and you're no longer are reliant on human tellers. Well, that's, that's interesting to have, think of an actual robot like coming up to the teller window and doing work for you at the bank. 
Uh, also in Fahrenheit 451, but in, um, uh, in Back to the Future 2, there was a great scene where the USA Today camera drone comes down and takes a picture to put into a newspaper in the futuristic world of 2015. It's amazing. A camera drone takes a picture and puts it in a paper. And so, of course, both of these things came together slightly different than anticipated. We had the ATM machines that, uh, of course, uh, are ubiquitous today. Those are sort of our robotic tellers. And, of course, camera drones are everywhere. Not quite what was anticipated by either Fahrenheit 451 or by Back to the Future 2, but um, the, both of these technologies have come into being in, in a big way. Um, so what do the supply chains of the future look like? What does the supply chain for delivering television to people look like even 10 years from now? That's, that's very difficult to predict. Um, but I, like I said, I think the important thing is to have a strategy to look at the technologies, to stay up to date, and to figure out the things that make sense for you. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm excited to be here is that I think the best way to do that is to talk with people, to find out what other people are doing, to look at strategies, uh, to ask questions, and to, to help make contacts and figure out what might make sense for you, what might make sense for your organization. So I'm excited to be here and learn about things over the next couple of days. I'm excited to share some ideas and, uh, and get into this over the next couple of days, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, so thank you all very much for listening. I'm happy to take a few questions if we got time for it. Yeah, we got time for uh, one or two questions. If anybody's got one, sure. Ah, oh, my boss. That's good. <laughs> Getting grilled now by the boss. Uh, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, can you give us maybe real quick your opinion on build versus buy when it comes to the metadata layer that has to drive all this video processing? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I focused a lot on media processing in terms of video essence. There is a whole other world, including metadata processing. Um, I've actually seen, so in order to do metadata well, you kind of need to master your metadata. You need to create fields and forms and a vocabulary that's consistent across an organization to really make it work. There are some commercial tools that help you do that well. So I've seen some strategies work well where you get a commercial tool that helps you master metadata, create that vocabulary that's common across your organization and then connect that commercial tool to these various systems like a MAM and a digital distribution tool that do that technology. So that's one way to go. I've actually had better luck with your metadata systems being custom built in-house. It's different for every organization. Everybody has a different choice, but the metadata systems I've seen actually work the best are systems that were really built around specific business needs, specific mastering of metadata. Now, given it's changing quickly, a new commercial tool could come along very quickly that could be awesome and it could really fit a lot of business needs. But historically, owning your metadata and owning how that metadata is designed, I found has been a very useful thing to kind of crack off on your own if you can. Got time for one more, probably. Not that this room is big enough that we need a microphone, but. <laughs> Hi, I have a, my name's Peter Flood. Um, I have a question on AI, but I want to make a comment to your boss's uh, question. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm basically going to say, um, in a buy decision, we're available. We process metadata. It becomes descriptive. And in fact, the descriptions basically lower the need for file and organization structure. So if anybody wants to talk, <laughs> we're around. But my question is to AI, and it's, I don't want to make it a complicated question, but obviously you are using AI for image recognition. What's your thinking around the quality control of that? Because a lot of our work realizes not, it's, it's subpar what comes out in most solutions, and I'm not picking on anybody. But so have you thought about a, a quality control when it comes out to the extent it's going into an archive or it's a real production? So that's my question. No, it's a very good question and, uh, and probably a whole topic forum discussion in and of itself. Um, high level, I think that it's still kind of early. Um, I think some of the AI stuff I've seen has been particularly useful for some use cases like speech to text where you're going to take uh, a long video, you're going to get speech to text back as a starting point, and then you might have a human curate the rest, and you might actually get usable closed caption or subtitles out of that. There are places where I think a human-assisted AI is extremely valuable and tenable today. Um, is it really to the point where we can just turn AI loose on an archive and let it run through and discover everything for us automatically? 
Probably not. There's, there's some human design that needs to go into it anyway in terms of, for your use cases, what assets need to relate to what, what's the most important to you. Um, so far, the stuff I've seen be most successful is has a level of human curation with it and has very specific use cases with it. Um, the general purpose stuff, I think, is probably a little ways off. But if you look at the list, you see there are a lot of companies in AI. Some are better at speech to text. Some are better at image recognition. Some are better at video. So kind of knowing that landscape and knowing what might work well for your specific use case when you're trying to automate something, um, I think it, it still takes some research and takes a level of human interaction. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, Dave's going to be on the session a little bit, so you can ask him a few more questions then. But uh, another hand for Dave, please. Thank you very much.